Hello and welcome. This is the podcast, Ask Dr. Love. If love is the answer, what is your question? Today is the 30th episode of Ask Dr. Love. Ask Dr. Love is heard on every iPod carrier, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Radio Play. If you want to listen to past episodes, you can go to anchor.fm slash askdrlove. If you want to tell your friends about it, say, hey Google, play Ask Dr. Love podcast. Hey Siri, play Ask Dr. Love podcast. So, we are ready to go. Today's topic of the show is food therapy. What in the kitchen's name is food therapy? Well, the Blue Dragon Tribe learned last night because we had Katniss and Deja making flax crackers and cashew cheese. And they're going to bring it in a little bit just so you can see it what it looks like because I've been talking about flax crackers for a couple of weeks now and we've been making them but we've been eating them so fast we haven't had a chance to show you what they look like so what is food therapy there are five flavors and there are five colors so the flavors are salt sweet sour bitter and pungent I learned that in high school So I'm going to say it again slower for the people who are trying to write things down. Salt and sweet, sour and bitter, and pungent. So you have taste buds on the inside of your cheeks that measure salt and sweet and sour and bitter. Now, pungent is a tricky one because people are like, well, what's pungent? Pungent is onions and garlic and scallions and leeks and shallots. Those are all pungent. And guess what color they are? They're all white. Now, what is bitter? Bitter is leafy greens. So your spinach, your uh, turnip greens, mustard greens, uh, Swiss chard, collard greens, those are all bitter, leafy greens. And then what is sweet? Sweet is all your yellow vegetables. So your carrots, your parsnips, your sweet peppers, your uh, summer squash, all those, uh, I said carrots, right? Squash, I said that too. So all of your yellow, orange, vegetables, sweet potatoes, jicama, those are all sweet, yellow, orange vegetables. That only leaves two left. So what is sour? So we have sour orange, sour cherry, persimmon. So typically your sour fruits are red. And that leaves one left. What color is that? Blue, purple, black. So sea vegetables are considered black because when they're dried, they turn black. And that is the salty flavor. So we have uh, hijiki, arame, wakame, nori, and dulse. Those are all sea vegetables that are considered black and salty. So our five flavors, salt, sweet, sour, bitter, and pungent, should be equivalent in the course of a week. So over a seven day period, you should have a balance of the five flavors and the five colors. And that's how we determine 
food therapy. Now, how do we apply that? Well, first of all, we have to determine, are you damp and cold or damp and hot? And then we have to determine, are you cold and dry or hot and dry? So imagine the four parameters. So we have hot and cold, and we have damp and dry. So we have cold damp, hot damp, cold dry, hot dry. Now, hopefully you're somewhere in the middle of those four parameters. And if you're in the middle, then you're probably okay. But people who have carry excess weight are kind of plumpish. And that is what we call dampness. Now, if your skin is dry, then if you have dry skin, probably you're dry. So that's an easy way for you to determine, are you damp or dry? Now, hot and cold are a little bit easier. If you carry a sweater with you everywhere you go, if you carry a jacket with you everywhere you go, if you're scared of air conditioning, then you are probably cold. And if you're always fanning yourself and always wanting to take off something and like, can you crank up the AC? Then you're probably hot. So again, there's no absolutes. We don't deal with extremes. So there's hot and damp and there's cold and damp. There's hot and dry and there's cold and dry. So you have to determine for yourself, unless you come to someone like me, who will then be able to tell you exactly if you're hot and damp, hot and dry, cold and damp, cold and dry. Now, that's how we evaluate your internal condition. And that's when we apply the foods and herbs to balance your condition. So, for example, let's say you are cold and damp. Why are you cold and damp? Because you're addicted to salads and you eat salads all day long. You eat salads three times a day, salad, salad, salad. Or you like cold food right out of the fridge. You open the fridge and you grab something and just eat it cold. You don't bother to warm it up. That's also going to create a cold condition. If you drink a lot of fluids, then you can also create a cold, damp condition. If you want ice uh, beverages, if you want ice in all your beverages, then that's going to create a cold and damp condition. So let's assume that you are cold and damp. And I tell you, you got to cut down on the salads, Miss Jones. But I love salad, Dr. Love. I don't want to give up the salad. So what do you think I'm going to tell her in order to balance? I'm going to use jalapeno peppers. I'm going to use African bird pepper to the salad. I'm going to add garlic to the salad. So I'm going to add hot and spicy things to the salad to warm it up. I'm going to add walnuts or sunflower seeds, which are dry. So I'm going to add dry things and I'm going to add spicy things to create balance in the salad. That is how we apply food therapy. Now, what if you're addicted to fruit and you eat 10 apples a day or something ridiculous like that? And you just keep eating fruit, 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 uh, bananas, whatever. Strawberries and bananas. I used to eat bananas and strawberries. I'd make a big bowl of bananas and strawberries. That was my junk food. So I would make a big bowl of that, I'd stick it in the fridge, and whenever I was stressed out, I would go to the fridge and I'd take out the bananas and strawberries and I'd eat that. That was my comfort food. That's what I thought was the least harmful way to deal with my inner anxiety. Does that resonate with anybody? <laughs> so 
when I went to acupuncture school, I discovered I can add cinnamon or I can bake the apples. And that would balance the cold and damp of eating an excessive amount of fruit. So that's how we use spices and, uh, and culinary herbs as medicine. And that is how we use food therapy. Okay, now let's suppose we were hot and dry. Let's say we were beef eaters or chicken eaters. Let's say we were chicken, corn, and cheese. Let's assume for one second that was our main diet, chicken, corn, and cheese. Would that create hot and dry? Hot and damp? Probably. It depends on how much we ate to create balance. So if we were the beef eaters or the chicken and corn eaters, then we, we would create dryness and heat in the body, heat and dryness. So how would you balance that? I've already given you the answer. It would be fruits and salads. So when I was thinking about transitioning off of meat, I would use a lot of onions and mushrooms and I kept shrinking the portion of my meat. And as I was shrinking the portion of meat from eight ounces to six ounces to four ounces to three ounces, I would increase the amount of onions and mushrooms. So that's how I did my transition diet until I went cold turkey. And then I found out that the reason they cook onions and mushrooms with steak is to pull out the impurities. And my brain exploded because I was thinking I would eat the onions and mushrooms and the toxins were being pulled out. They threw the onions and mushrooms away and I couldn't figure out why. So there's a reason why everything in food, and if you don't understand the reason, then you cannot benefit from that. So let's take curry powder, for example. The main ingredient in curry is turmeric. Turmeric does not taste very good by itself. So we have to add a little garlic powder, a little cayenne pepper, a little fenugreek. Uh, we have to add other seasonings and spices to make the turmeric taste good. Now, why is that even important? Well, there was a time when there was no refrigeration, which is for like 80,000 years, there's no refrigeration. So, the way we cooked, you had a big pot of something, of stew, of soup, and we would cut up chunks of meat and veggies and what have you, and we made a big fire, and mama would stir that, and then everybody would get a bowl of soup, okay? And then what would happen is the next morning, we would eat the leftovers. And sometimes it would spoil and then we would get sick. So mama figured out if I put turmeric in the soup, it won't spoil. But like I said previously, the turmeric doesn't taste good. So then they added spices to turn the turmeric into an acceptable substance as medicine. So curry was actually medicine to prevent the food from spoiling. And of course, we don't know that. And that happened so long ago that Indian people don't know that. The only reason the Chinese know it is because they know the medicinal benefits of culinary spices. Okay, we have a nice little display here of, oh, look at that. Okay, this is our cashew cheese. This is our cashew cheese. I don't wanna spill it. And these are, oh, those look lovely. Don't they look lovely? 
Don't they look lovely? They look beautiful. Okay. So, I love flax crackers, and when I chew flax crackers, they get stuck in my teeth. So I'm not going to do it on camera. If you're on Instagram, you can see Katniss enjoying the flax crackers with the cashew cheese. Flax crackers. Flax crackers. So, um, we're very creative here at the Blue Dragon Tribe, and we're going to make different kinds of flax crackers. Now, this particular flax crackers was made with yellow, sweet peppers, and onions. So we took a pound of flax crackers, half of an onion, and three yellow peppers, and chopped up. It was actually a quarter of, an, of a red onion three yellow peppers and chop that up put that into the food processor this menu is for you Rachel and we mix it eh, for about five six minutes that was it and then spread it real thin put it in the dehydrator and exquisite now the cashew cheese we soaked it overnight we used about uh, three tablespoons of nutritional yeast three tablespoons of garlic salt, about one tablespoon of chili powder, and one teaspoon of cayenne. And that was it. And put it in a high-speed blender. Oh, I forgot. We've added coconut milk and coconut meat to give it the creamy, creamy. Excellent. Now, half of that, you, you saw how creamy it looked, right? Half of that we're going to put in the dehydrator till it gets kind of firm and, it, and it's, going to, it's going to be spreadable and cuttable. So we're going to keep some creamy and some we're going to dehydrate in order to make cuttable and make sandwich cheese out of it. Wow. So we've got all kinds of things for you. You don't need to eat bread. Now, 5,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, the way they made bread was by wheat, and they would get two round stones, and they would cut a hole in the stones, and they would pour the wheat, and then they would get two donkeys, and the donkeys would walk in a circle, and they would grind the wheat into flour. But about 140, 50 years ago, they decided that the wheat germ, which contains the protein and the fat, would spoil after about three weeks of storage. So they decided to remove the wheat germ so the flour would not go rancid. Then they decided, eh, we don't like the brown flecks in the flour, so we're going to remove the husk. And what that leaves is the endosperm, and then they decided they were going to hybridize the wheat to make white wheat. Don't ask me why. It's stupidity. There's nothing wrong with the color of wheat. Brown bread has always been the color of bread for at least five, 6,000 years. But these American farmers in the 1840s... Food discrimination. Food discrimination. Because they wanted to sell the idea of purity. So white flour and white sugar became the symbol of purity and then white bread. So they wanted to eat white bread by taking out the husk and taking out the germ and then adding nutrients back in. So if you go to your grocery store and you look at the bread label, it says enriched. Well, if God made wheat perfect, then why do you have to enrich it? Why do, you have to, why do you have to add B1, B2, B3, and B5? Why do you have to add B vitamins if the bread and the wheat is already perfect? Because you're trying to prolong the shelf life. Now, I was early on to the holistic way of living. And there was a company that added fiber to their bread. And I was a big proponent of this company and I had a radio show in New York City and I promoted this particular bread company until I found out the fiber they were using was wood chips. 
They would go to the sawmill and get the wood chips. They would heat steam the wood chips and then add it to the batter and then say, our bread is fiber enriched. Now I was incensed. I wrote letters, I made phone calls. How can you add wood fiber to bread and call it healthy? And you know what they told me? It's not poisonous. It is a normal cellulose additive. And I was like, if that doesn't beat all, these, <laughs> insert your expletive there, and that's when I said, I'm pulling back and I'm going to investigate anybody who makes a health claim. I'm going to investigate them. I'm going to go to the factory. I'm going to go find out how and why they do what they do and put that on the label or not tell us what's on the label. So I've been your health advocate for 40 years. I've been doing this a really long time. I was 20 years on regular radio in New York and Florida on three stations until they got bought out and all the health talk is off the air. And by the time I figured out what happened in Florida, they had taken off health talk in LA, they took off health talk in St. Louis, they took off health talk in Chicago, and the only place you can find health talk is in DC because of college radio stations. There's no more health talk anywhere in this country that tells the truth, that's not sponsor driven, promoting their brand of lies. Because anybody who's in business to sell you a product, I'm automatically suspicious of because I've been promoting too many products and then the companies get sold and then the new owners and in order to make more money switch out the better ingredients for the cheaper ingredients. And I can tell because I'm sensitive to those things. So I'm your advocate. At this time we're going to open up for questions. This is your chance to ask Dr. Love. I hope Melody Miller is watching. She, I hope she has a question. Ah, oh, Melody Miller's on the line. Yeah. Okay. Before I take her question, we want to say put your comment in to Facebook, IG, YouTube, or are we still texting to at Ask Doctor Love to eight one zero one zero? You can do that anytime. Yeah, to join your so, Melody Miller's question is? What can I do when I have a lot of gas after eating vegetables? You can do a 21 day juice feast. So the juice feast, Miss Melody Miller, is seven days of juicing for dinner where you eat breakfast and lunch seven days of juicing for breakfast and dinner and then seven days of juicing four times a day. Now how is that going to eliminate my gas? Your spleen manufactures digestive enzymes. If you're eating a variety of foods then the digestive enzymes don't get a chance to work on breaking down the foods to prevent the gas. So you have to eat the same foods for at least seven days for your body to remember how to make the digestive enzymes. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Melody also has a comment. She said, Kraft did the same with their Parmesan cheese until they were sued. I can only imagine there were more companies that did the same. Yes, there's tons of companies that put additives in, but they were protected by the laws that said it was the additives wasn't poisonous. So I'm sure uh, Kraft made a fatal error <laughs> in adding something that was poisonous. Okay, Serena Wiley, we need to get you in on WNCU 
90.7 in Durham, North Carolina, exclamation point. Well, all you have to do is call the host of one of the shows and arrange we're making uh, the, the new decisions on what's going to happen in health and everything else. Yolanda Ahadzi, Dr. Love, can we have you expand, expound a little bit more on dampness and coldness for those with a larger middle section? Aha, uh -huh. okay. Um, dampness is when you're actually carrying excessive weight around your middle. So in the upper part of your body, you have the heart and lungs, and that affects your circulatory system. Below the belly button, you have the small and large intestines. But in the middle, you have the stomach, spleen, pancreas, and liver. And carrying excessive weight around there is dangerous to your health. So the liver can store up to eight pounds of fat. And so there's a condition called fatty liver disease. And the only way to deal with fatty liver is to do the 21 day juice feast every month for six months. In addition to that, 50 to 60% of your diet has to be raw food when you come off of that six months. I've had a dozen patients with fatty liver disease resolve themselves of that condition just by diet alone. Now, the stomach is, if you put your thumb under the breastbone, that's the actual size and location of the stomach. If you put your left hand behind your right hand, that's the location of your pancreas, which regulates insulin which is the glucose or the blood sugar or the gasoline of the body. If we slide the left hand to the left, that's the spleen, the right hand to the right, that's the liver. So all those organs are right there. Now on the sides, their interstitial fluid collects. Below the belly button, there's something called the small intestines. The small intestines has good bacteria that lives in an alkaline environment. At the end of the small intestine, there's something called the ileocecal valve. That's the opening from the small to the large intestine. If you do not chew your food very well, the sphincter that opens to the small to the large gets caught open. And the large intestine, which has an acid environment, over time changes the small intestine environment to acid. So you have stomach acid, small intestine acid, and large intestine acid. And the little nasties that grow in the large intestine get into the small intestine and literally eat holes in the small intestine. And that's what we call bacterial overgrowth of the small intestine. And how we can tell that is that your sides swell up. So you're not fat this way, you're fat this way, all right? So when you have a large midsection, I can pretty much tell if it's small intestine, if it's spleen, or is it, if it's liver. But that's just my 40 years of experience. Okay. Please talk about agave and how it is not a health food. I'm so glad you asked me that question. Um, about two years ago, I was recommending uh, agave, and my son called me on the phone, which was really odd and unusual. His mother is a strict vegan. She's a raw foodist and very influential in my life and his. And he said, Dad, agave is a manufactured product. It's not a health food product. And I'm like, how do you know? And he said, when they make agave into tequila, what's left over, the pulp that's left over, they actually boil that. 
and then they concentrate it. So agave syrup is, is what's left over of the pulp of the agave plant. And he said, that's, that's just not a good thing. So when agave first came out, Whole Foods was one of the first companies to jump on it and start selling it. And at that moment, I believed that Whole Foods was honest and true. And I was in for a rude awakening. As, again, as I track things back to its source, my son was absolutely right. Agave is not a good product. It's not a health food product. It's um, uh, highly processed. It's a processed food. So I discovered yacon, which is a uh, plant from South America. And yacon is also a sugar substitute. I also discovered monk fruit, uh, which is actually a citrus that tastes very bitter. But once you ferment it, it becomes a natural sweetener. And of course, you may have heard of stevia, which is a grass also lightly processed and then that becomes a natural sweetener so throw away the agave and substitute your cone coconut sugar uh, monk fruit or stevia robert eldemeyer please talk about beyond meat i cannot talk about a single product because that opens me up for lawsuits when I attack a particular company. I can p attack an industry like agave is an industry, but I can't name a particular company. So I cannot talk about Beyond Meat other than to say, I would not eat it if I were you. <laughs> Serena asked, how do you repair the holes in the intestine? Aha! In order to repair the holes in the intestines, the first thing we have to do is close the ileocecal valve. Then we have to go on a high alkaline diet so that we can heal the internal condition of the small intestines. And then that means we have to take prebiotics and probiotics, which then is the good bacteria that will then repair the holes in the small intestines. Uh, Serena has a follow-up follow question. What about eating Moringa leaf powder in smoothies? I don't know enough information about Moringa. I just know that there's multiple varieties. I know that there is one variety that supposedly is more medicinal than the other varieties. And there's a lot of people making claims. I took Moringa every day for a year and I found no appreciable difference. In the past, after I fast and somebody comes to me with a new product, I'll take that new product three, five, seven days and my body will absolutely tell me how that product works. But after taking it for a year, I found no appreciable difference. So I can't say anything about Moringa. Okay. Melody Miller on Facebook asks, is there a way to improve spider veins? Okay, I'm glad you asked me that question because that is dirty blood. So spider veins are on their way to becoming varicose veins. Now, the arteries carry the groceries, the veins carry the garbage. Spider veins typically are in the back of the legs, but sometimes in the front of the legs. If the veins are occluded with plaque, and plaque is caused by salt, sugar, dairy, flour, animal fat and fried. I'm going to say that again in case you want to write it down. Salt and sugar, dairy flour, animal fat, and fried. And those things cause plaque in the blood vessels, particularly the veins. And that is why you have 
spider veins because you're eating those kinds of foods. So how do we get rid of spider veins? Well, you could inject ozone, you could inject saline, or you could clean up your diet. And what did I used to say? Change your, <laughs> change your diet. Change your damn diet. I've been saying that for 35 years, 36 years now. Change your damn diet. Change your damn diet. So that's how you prevent and reverse spider veins, okay? So how do we clean the blood vessels? 21 day juice feasting. Celery juice, a pound of celery juiced three times a day for 90 days will clear up your spider veins. Nobody wants to drink celery juice three times a day for 90 days. So what else you got, Doc? <laughs> well, we'll add a little carrot, we'll add a little beet, make it sweet, but we'll still get it in there. Well, I can't live on celery, carrot, beet juice forever. No, just 90 days. No, I can't do that. All right, so we start with three weeks, take a week off, three weeks, take, and we do, that's how we do it gradually, unless you're like a movie star or a leg model or a bathing suit model, in which case you gotta do it instantly. Okay. So how do you access the flash crackers and the cashew cheese? How do you access cooking raw with Dr. Love? How do you access the information that I'm sharing with you? Well, you've got to go to lovechigong.com, become a member of the tribe, and then you have access to the archive of all the instructional videos that I have for the last nine years. Only when you become a member of the tribe at lovechigong.com. If you're, if you just want a list of the courses that I'm going to teach, you can go to 21daystowellness.com to find out about the juice feasting. The, the numerals 21daystowellness.com to start there. Question. One more question. What is the difference between purple sea moss and regular sea moss? Do you recommend a credible source for purchasing sea moss? This is from J Juice. Joy Juice. Well, the credible source I have is Love and Peace Wellness in Fort Lauderdale. And at one point, they will be actually on the show. Okay. Question. Can I drink homemade unsweetened nut milk during a juice fast? This was from Robert Eldenayer. Dear Robert, a juice feast is vegetables. So nut milk does not <laughs> no you can't do that Robert <laughs> it's got to be celery carrot beet 50% celery 25% carrot 25% beet now to be fair Robert lives in a very cold environment at high elevation so uh, if it was like uh, 20 degrees and you were trying to uh, fast on veggie juices yeah, maybe, but I think that your chi is very strong, Robert. I think you'll be able to do it without the nut milk. Okay, <laughs> okay. Kia Larice, La first time listener. What do you think about the keto lifestyle, low carb, high fat? Okay, I think the keto lifestyle is crazy because there's no historical basis for keto that is credible we didn't live back then and their assumption based upon the garbage of 
caveman dwellers is just wrong, that we found out the science is wrong. So the premise of keto doesn't follow through with logic. So the keto lifestyle does not make sense. What I did is I went to Central America and I looked for the people who were the healthiest and lived the longest and I wrote down their diet. I went to Persia and I looked for the people who lived the longest and were the healthiest. And then I went to Africa and I looked for the people who lived the longest and well. And then I went to Turkey and then I went to India. So I went all over the world searching for who was the healthiest and who lived the longest. And on that basis, I came up with multiple diets. There is no one size fits all. So I'm gonna tell you a little story about John Kennedy III, who Peace Corps went to Africa to volunteer for the Peace Corps, and he got deathly ill, and they were gonna send him back home. And he said, you know what, let me go see the medicine man in the community that I'm living and working. And the medicine man says, you have to eat goat meat. And he was a committed vegetarian. And he was like, no, I can't eat an animal. It's a crime against God. No, I can't eat the goat meat. And then the guy said, well, I guess we're shipping you back home. So he says, okay, I'll eat it one time. And he perked up so quickly that he ate it a little bit three days in a row and his energy came back and he's like, oh, I guess I have to eat goat meat in order to live in the mountains in Africa. So your geography determines your biology. So where you live and the amount of energy put out determines what your requirements are. So there is no one size fits all to diet. Tiffany Kelly from Facebook wants to know how to increase circulation in the lower body. I'm so glad you asked me that question. Now, obviously, logic would say running, biking, jumping rope, climbing trees. But that's so boring. So I'm going to recommend dancing and qigong. So if you've been following me on Facebook, you know that every morning I do a particular class where you go up on your toes, bend your knees, rock back on your heels. So this is what it looks like. Okay, so up on your heels, up on your toes. And rocking, that way I call them calf rock, you will increase blood circulation to the lower extremities. Now, if you sit with your legs open, guess what happens to the blood in your groin? The femoral artery, so if you put your finger on the pubic bone, slide it out to the, to the groin, that is where the femoral artery is. If you're a lady and you sit like this, what are you doing to your femoral artery? You're clamping it off and you're preventing blood flow into the lower extremities. So you do not ever want to cross your legs and sit like this. Oh, but socially, you have to cross your legs. You do not. You could wear pants, or you could just sit with your legs closed. There's so many ways that you can sit where you don't block blood flow of the femoral artery into the leg. So Al22NY from IG asks, how do you feel about different sources of salmon? Okay, that's another good question. Okay, so there is pink salmon, which is the young salmon. And then there is the red salmon, which is the adult salmon. And there is farmed salmon, and then there is wild caught salmon, and then there's the salmon that they lie about. <laughs> now, I love salmon. The best salmon to have is the pink salmon, which is the young salmon, which means it has the least amount of mercury. Because when you eat 
the bigger fish on a regular basis, you're going to get more mercury, which may end up in your brain. And of course, we don't want that. So if I were you, it would have to be wild caught pink salmon no more than once a week. I hope that answers your question. says they're very appreciative of your wisdom yeah, the and same training. Person. I appreciate it. It's the same person. Thank you. Al 22. Eight, well, I appreciate you for watching and tuning in and I'd appreciate you even better if you go to lovechigong.com and join the tribe of the Blue Dragons because we're here to lift you up to unburden you of all the things that hold you down, to help you dispel automatic negative thinking, self-destructive behaviors, and self-limiting beliefs. That's what we do. We help you fly. Stephanie Saban says, thank you, Dr. Love, learning so much. Hi, Stephanie. I'm glad you tuned in to the podcast today. And I want to do a podcast on the three things that cause breast cancer. The, th the three things that I focus on that cause breast cancer. There's many, many causes of breast cancer. But the three things that I think that are most important that we can do something about, that we have control over for prevention. And I would love to have you on at that time. <laughs> All right. Um, the next question will be unanswered. You could come tomorrow and listen to it. Okay. Unless you want to answer. Okay. With time what, check. What diet would you recommend for people who suffer from rheumatoid arthritis? Yeah. Rheumatoid arthritis. I would recommend the raw food diet. Fifty percent raw. That's what I would recommend. But the details of that, we can go into in another class, exactly how to work out what a raw food diet looks like. And I think that's an important, it's an important thing. We'll add that to our list. But uh, RA is very common. RA is the short for rheumatoid arthritis, and there's a lot of people that have it. So yeah. I'd be happy to uh, share that with you. And. Well, today they're coming in. A lot of questions. That's great. So. Tomorrow, <laughs> how do they find out about your podcast on Anchor? Anchor.fm slash Ask Dr. Love. You can access the previous podcast or you can go to iTunes iHeartRadio, Radio Play, and Spotify. We're on Spotify. So, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Um, I'm honored by your presence. And I hope I can share my confidence in helping you learn and grow and how to be your own healer. Because... Your health is in your hands. And prevention is the only cure. And in order to be well, you got to chi well. Thank you for watching. See you tomorrow.